Welcome to SHIFT, a college admissions ACT, SAT, and CLT podcast for a changing world. I'm Tyler, the founder of Achievable, and we have an affordable ACT course that includes everything you need to ace your ACT. A full textbook, tons of questions backed by our memory-enhancing algorithm, videos on key topics, a built-in study planner, and full-length practice exams. You can get a free trial at Achievable.me, and if you like it, the code podcast gets you 10% off at checkout. Now, let's get started. So today we've got Ravi Bhatia from Ashland Prep, and Ravi, really excited to have you on the show. Uh, If you could just share a little bit about yourself, that'd be great. Yeah, thank you, Tyler. Um, Appreciate it, man. I'm happy to be here. Um, So yeah, my name is Ravi. I am the founder of Ashland Prep. Uh, We're based in Venice, California, and uh, I started the company in 2019 um, to be a high-end online boutique agency uh, for tutoring, and we've evolved into focusing on Uh, just emotion-driven test prep, you know, focusing primarily on helping students uh, deal with their academic traumas and getting through that as part of the testing process. And uh, we've been so far having a lot of success in that niche. And uh, so here I am today. Thank you for, thank you for having me. That's great. Yeah, no, I'm glad to have you. And today we're going to be talking about uh, something that you kind of said to me while we were doing our prep, which is there's never been a better time to take the SAT or ACT, uh, which I think is a pretty cool take. And I'm curious, like, why, what made you say that? Or where does that come from? Yeah, so, you know, first of all, there is a lot of confusion that makes it seem the opposite. Uh, Tyler, I'm sure you've Mm -hmm. seen this already amongst your students where, uh, this test optional thing creates a lot of confusion. And the confusion is right. definitely a downside, without question. Uh, however, um, you know, even, Tyler, forgive me for putting you on the spot here, but when did you take mm-hmm. the SAT or ACT? Did you take one of those tests? I took the SAT in 2009. Gotcha. I think? Okay, cool. Yeah, I took or, it. Was it 2009? Yeah, or, no, wait. 2005, I think. I need to remember when I graduated high school. It's been a long time. Got you. Yeah. So I don't want to give away your age, man. So forgive me. But uh, that's okay. (laughs) Yeah. I took it in, I believe, 07. And back then, the University of California required, you know, not only the SAT or ACT, but also subject tests, like three of them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then, you didn't have a choice. You basically had to take the SAT or ACT. And Mm -hmm. the only way to get the best information back then was through paying for classes or paying for private tutoring. A lot of the information was relatively gate kept, except for like, you know, there were some books here and there, but you couldn't figure out how to study it. And if you're a high school kid, very difficult to do that on your own. Uh, Now, there's never been more free resources to study. And on top of that, there's never been more flexibility in terms of where you can submit your scores or not. So because mm-hmm. of that flexibility for the vast majority of students who are not applying to the Ivy Leagues, which is a new thing this year, by the way, again, like during COVID, you can still get in without taking a lot of these tests. Um, mm-hmm. But now you can pick and choose. So, you know. There's just so much variety and optionality that was never there before. Um, And that's in light to the trends that were accelerated by COVID. Uh, So COVID made it so people couldn't take these tests and colleges Mm -hmm. had to adapt and it accelerated the trend that was already happening. Uh, So while some schools are going back to not being test optional, we're still in a really great place. And to be specific, I would say maybe one or two years ago, was the best time to take the ACT mm-hmm. or SAT for everybody. Uh, now it's still the best time for the majority who may not be applying to the Ivy Leagues. Well, so you're, what you're implying is that because less people are taking it, more it's better for you to take it? Is that roughly what you're saying? Well, it's more about the fact that um, it's not about the number of people. It's more about taking it. There's nothing to lose and everything to gain. And in the Mm -hmm. past, you had everything to lose, basically. You could be a perfect student in your school, but the scores could tank your chances at admissions. 
Uh, mm-hmm. Now, you know, for the most part, there's so many schools that are still test optional. You can be a great student. And if you put in the prep and it still doesn't work, you can still get into a great school, great colleges. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, it's... Well, because you just don't submit your scores, right? Yeah. So you can choose to submit to schools where your scores would help and then choose not to submit to schools where it wouldn't help. And you would have the same grades in either scenario. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you can just take it one school at a time and say, okay, I'm going to submit to NYU, but not to Harvard or whatever it is that you're applying to, um, mm-hmm. you know, and then if you did that, you can be, again, there's a lot of flexibility. And because of that, there's nothing to lose, everything to gain. And you can study at a very high level um, for a very low barrier of entry. You know, there's so many resources available now that weren't available, Tyler, when you and I were thinking about these tests uh, way back in the day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a valid point, is that, like, it's, I think that in terms of preparing, it is probably about as accessible as it's ever been, right? Because you've got, like, all the free resources on Khan Academy, as well as there's tons of free resources on YouTube. Things like this podcast, though, honestly, for, you know, actually practicing questions, I think you go to YouTube. And just in general, like, you actually can get, call it sort of 70, 80 percent of what like a tutor used to do or still does uh, for free on the Internet. Right. And then if you are willing to spend another kind of hundred to two hundred dollars, there are prep courses. Achievable has one. There's also many others. Um that are you know complete courses that will teach you everything a tutor you know would have covered and then at that point tutors are more for like as you kind of talked about in your intro like the consultative aspect right it's like you know oh like i need to you know kind of talk around the edges or around like the subjective like like the the stuff that comes with to standardized testing mentally and things like that or you know, okay, we're going to sit down, we're going to figure out why you can't solve circle problems or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, And, but yeah, like the, in terms of being able to show your strength by, you know, using free or low cost resources to get a good ACT or SAT score, I'd agree that I think that it's probably the best it's ever been in that regard. Yeah, it is. And I think one point of confusion um, that needs to be clarified as well, and I'm not sure uh, who would be listening to this podcast, I would need to hear this. But, you know, the one thing that schools definitely do and have been doing is depending on where you go to high school, they will understand and contextualize your scores. So Mm -hmm. here in LA, uh, you know, years ago, I did some SAT prep work at a school in in Inglewood that was, you know, uh, I would say the population was relatively low income compared to what you would see at the private high schools in LA. And the top 10% Mm -hmm. of the classes at that school back then, at that high school in Inglewood, was scoring, you know, the equivalent of what is now a 12 or 1300 um, Mm here. On the, on the SAT, and colleges will use that data, and they would contextualize that data, generally speaking. They, they still do that. And so, you know, when you see that data on, online uh, regarding, like, you know, these 1500s that get in and so on and so forth, and that there's that middle range is super high, and it seems that high, mm-hmm. it's important to remember that every school is showing the, the middle 50% and not the bot the below twenty five percent that they're also accepting as well too, so um, right yeah well and also it's it's like you said it has a lot to do with context right like I just did an episode um, with the students that got into Harvard from Alabama and they do not have a sixteen hundred or mm-hmm. even a fifteen hundred like SAT score or things like that right or I think they did the ACT and I think one of them had a really strong score. Uh, but in any case, like it wasn't about that, right? It was about like what they're what these admissions officers want is they want to not just have a a, a 
class full of Brennans from Connecticut yep. who went to like prep schools their whole life and, you know, got like a 1480 or whatever, 1530 and like had all of the help in the world to get there. Right. Like they, they could easily fill their class three times over with people like that because that's how many of those apply, but they really want to have a diverse group. And a lot of that comes from the context of where you're from. Right. So, I mean, when you look at like Dartmouth's statement on going back to requiring test scores, they're, one of the things that they said was like, actually test scores are one of the best ways that we can find these sort of like diamond in the rough people um, and like bring, like have more equity in the process rather than less. Yeah. And it it sounds like they're paying lip service to diversity and I can see how parents will be skeptical of that. But the reality is, um, you know, if you're going to a school that's generally under-resourced, um, and you're in the top 10% of that class, um, you know, there are some kids that are there that unfortunately got straight A's because of grade inflation for a variety of reasons. And, you know, our school- Oh yeah, there's actually, tons of grade inflation. Yeah, and, you know, some of those kids, unfortunately, just aren't actually necessarily in the best spot to thrive at those schools. Um, and without test scores, it's actually really difficult to tell which one of those, which types of those students would uh, really thrive in, in a really rigorous environment and be able to adapt, uh, whether in a place that has a ton of resources, but also has a ton of competition. I mean, these kids are going to school with kids who've had all the resources, who've you know, been taking APs at a high level, getting fives on them. And you know, the more data you can give a school, I think the better they can contextualize it and make sure you're in a situation where you can succeed. So, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm pretty bullish on the value of these tests. I may be a little bit biased, but um, just looking at the data and how it's playing out, I think uh, colleges are starting to see that. And I think if we look at it as an opportunity rather than a gatekeeping mechanism, uh, a lot more value can can be brought in from these tests with families and the students who are taking it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's also, if you, I think that in particular, like where the tests are misunderstood is in those communities where it's not part of the standard, you know, like process, right? Like obviously if you're going to some college preparatory high school or fancy private school, like they're going to be all over this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the people that stand the most to gain from the current sort of testing universe are the people that, you know, go to a public school that's maybe not one of the top one, right? Or go to, you know, just go to like an average school in their state, right? Because, you know, my, the public high school closest to me, like, you know, the valedictorian typically goes to like a local, like a local state college, right? And that's great. Um, but at the end of the day, like if you were already kind of at that academic level where you're either like valedictorian or close to it, you know, and you wanted to go to Harvard, like just you, the way to really get people's attention is through a good test score. And again, like you said, you don't really have a whole lot to lose if it doesn't work out. And there's also in terms of like the investment, you know, because there's so many free and cheap resources now it really is about like the time investment more than anything else yeah exactly and i think the way to look at it too and you know a lot of these students um they have so much going on if, if you go to a public institution that has a relatively low income population in terms of the what the metrics show um many of those students have full-time jobs or not full-time jobs but significant part-time jobs like 15 to 30 hours a week on top of school and on top of caring for family members and right and so it ends up being a really difficult thing to prioritize so when the message is hey it's optional uh a lot of these counselors just say don't don't bother but Mm -hmm. the reality is if you take one of those students who is uc eligible who can get into the university of california which doesn't take ACT or SAT scores anymore. Um, 
the financial aid package at the UCs is generally not as great as the equivalent private school. Um, mm -hmm. And so if you think about taking the test and getting a score that, let's say, an NYU uh, would be impressed with, and you're making below $100,000 a year, NYU has a policy where they'll, they'll pay your full tuition. You know, like if you mm -hmm. make, and they'll have a need blind admissions process and they'll, they'll do that. And you wouldn't necessarily know about that and you wouldn't take the test. And so there's real ROI in, in actually taking it and submitting to a school that you don't think uh, would potentially be impressed. But, um, mm -hmm. you know, that's it. Well, and that's, that's like the financial aid part is, I'm glad you brought up because that's such a big piece of, where you can actually get value out of this whole process um, is that having good test scores gives you a lot of financial aid opportunities, mm -hmm. right? For merit-based aid um, in particular. And that can save you thousands or even tens of thousands of dollars on your tuition, you know, room and board, like textbooks, like all kinds of different things. Right. I mean, um, there are a lot of great tools out there and, and people better versed than I and like how to go get scholarship. But in general, they pretty much are relying on like your quote unquote resume, your essay, and then your academics and your test scores. And again, like these test scores are essentially one of the better ways to differentiate yourself when everybody's got great inflation, right? Everybody's got like a Four point, I think it was forty-seven percent of American high school students have a four point zero or better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy, <laughs> right? So, and then everybody's got a million extracurriculars now, um, and so it's like, how do you stand out, right? And for better or for worse, like this is one of the best ways to do it. Yeah, in terms of time efficiency too, right? Like, what better way can mm -hmm. you boost your profile in fifty to a hundred hours of your time? Right. You know, a class yeah. is all year long, right? You're taking a class, you're preparing for it, the AP. Those are like, you know, multiples of hundreds of hours you're spending on school and your academic profile. And so the time versus ROI measure for testing is, is still very high for a majority of students. And, you know, students who aren't cut out for it, they can tell almost immediately within five to 10 hours of at least trying it out from one practice test right. for the ACT or SAT. Like they can recognize, you know what? I'm not going to get close. It's okay. I'm not going to bother. Um, but, you know, we're talking about the students who assume that they won't be good. And yeah. I think... Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, that's, that's it. The kids who assume that they won't be good, but then they take it and they realize, wow, with only 50 hours, I can really boost my chances. There's a lot of kids like that that have been untapped in the past, you know, few years since COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I think that's what I wanted to also kind of circle back to a little bit in this conversation. It's like you said, you know, basically that not just that it's a, that taking the ACT and SCT is important or a great way to differentiate yourself. It's that like now is the best time. Yep. Right. So why now? Yeah. Uh, just to reiterate that as well, it's the optionality. So. Mm -hmm. You know, the ability to not have to do it and use it only in the circumstance where it can help you. Um, right. Because if you can give a college extra data that shows that you belong, you can do that and you can just submit to that school. But if that data doesn't help you, you don't have to. And years ago, even just three or four years ago, when I first started my company, you know, you had to take these tests and you had no choice and you had to submit whether or not your scores were there. And in a lot of cases, um, it could jeopardize your chances. I remember when I was in, in 2007, I was really obsessed with Duke University and I didn't get in, which is fine. Um, but <laughs> I was really into it. And like, I used to watch like all the videos online and they had this one video of the admissions team at Duke and they were comparing two students in the video. and. I don't think they meant to trigger anxiety, but they had a kid with a 1450 and a kid with a 1550 or something like that. I could be wrong about that data. And one of the admissions officers was like, oh, well, those SAT scores are low. And uh, <laughs> I heard that and I was like, wow, they're actually showing this in their promotional materials um, in 2007. 
And you know now these it was a it was a different time. It was back a different then, time. I feel like if yeah. you if you go watch old stand up comedy from back then, you're like, oh wow, things really have changed. <laughs> yeah, but, that's, yeah, that's another thing we can talk about is you know how things were in comedy that you can't get away with anymore. Um, some of my favorite movies just not no yeah. longer PC, and I cringe now at a lot of it um, for better or for worse. But yeah, I guess you can say that testing has gone the same way as comedy; it's evolved. Yeah, well, and I think it's also, I mean, it's probably a good thing that, you know, you can, you don't, there isn't like this, like, you have to do it pressure, like you said, um, there are some students that, you know, they're working part time, or they're like, they're doing like, just a bunch of other things that make it so test prep is not a priority. And that's, that's like, it's nice that that option exists. And I think it also means, like you said, that essentially, you know, there's, I don't want to say less competition, because I think at the top, there's still, it's still just as competitive. But like, in your, you know, particular application pool applying to so and so college, right? Like, you are probably if you have, you have an opportunity with good test scores, that you wouldn't otherwise exist. Yeah, that's an interesting way to look at it. And I can't necessarily comment on the, the inner workings of admissions and and all of that. I, I think what I can comment on is just the advantages of trying to give colleges as much evidence as you can to show that you belong. Mm -hmm. And so if you're close to a score that shows it, you know, there's... And I would also look at the data from colleges. Um, if you're really a parent who's super savvy or a student who's super savvy, um, look at the data before COVID that may have been less skewed towards um, and more accurate about who they actually accept. Because what's been happening during COVID is only the students with top scores are showing that they submit. And colleges are more than happy to show that data to show, you know, how, look at the Look how amazing these kids are. Um, but the reality Right, look at is, the super high scores that everyone yeah, is submitting here, yeah. Exactly. Um, but Yeah, I've heard that. I mean, just today I was looking at, like, a, um, like there's a Facebook group of, like, tutors and admissions counselors that I'm in. And TPA. And someone was, yeah, and somebody, somebody said, like, my client doesn't want to submit a 33 ACT score <laughs> because I think it's too low. And it's like, I, I looked it up and it's 95th to 98th percentile for the different section. Like, it's just like, that's a good score. Even if you're applying to Harvard and Stanford exclusively, that score is not going to hurt you. No. Right? I think that there's this like a lot of un misplaced anxiety because the colleges are like, it's just like you said with the Duke video, they're kind of like, they want everyone to have the highest scores possible because like they probably have benchmarks for that. And like their ranking in the U S news world report is somewhat reliant on it. And I'm sure that's like something that they care a lot about. But at the end of the day, like most people who get in, you know, you could say this, half of them are below average. <laughs> and then yeah. also like, if you are, you know, a little bit below average, but still pretty close, that's going to be totally fine, right? Um, yeah, I think that there's this misinformation around that. Yeah, I think there definitely is as well, too. Um, the scores are contextualized with a much broader part of the application. And, uh, mm. you know, if you're testing at a 32, 33, there are many, many, many students who get in the top schools with those scores. And alternatively, what I tell parents, there are many students who get perfect scores and perfect grades who don't get in. And so, you know, a lot of families that I've worked with, they tend to operate under the premise that you get scores and grades and things open up. But really, it's all part of a broader picture that these schools are trying to create. And there's an element of luck um, with if, if it just so happens that the class that the school is trying to create one particular year wants more of your type of student, great. Um, but then, you know, so anyway, the bottom line there is that have the data, use the data, submit it where it mm -hmm. counts, don't submit it if you don't think it'll help. 
And that optionality is why there's never been a better time to take these tests. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. This has been Shift, a college admissions podcast for a changing world, hosted by Tyler from Achievable with Ravi Bhatia from Ashland Prep. And you can get a free trial of Achievable's ACT course at achievable.me and use the code podcast to get 10% off.